Good morning. Well, welcome to Lifting Your Spirit, a monthly broadcast in which we interview people about their spiritual lives and hear how they would encourage other people to lift their spirit. I'm Reverend Joel Grossman, an interfaith minister, director of spiritual services at Constellation Hospice in Newburyport, and I offer spiritual coaching on a donation basis. I'm Ted Jones. I'm a, a meditation teacher at North Shore Insight Meditation Center. Our show is based on the following four assumptions. One, everybody is spiritual. Sometimes we are conscious and active in our spirituality, sometimes not, but even when we're not, we're still spiritual. There are many ways to lift your spirit, not only through religious practices, but also through nature, art, human relationships, service to others. That's just to mention a few. And three, each person's spiritual path is unique and may change in small or large ways over time. And it's important to respect your own spiritual path, trusting that one step leads to another, and also to respect the spiritual, unique spiritual journey of other people, regardless of how different it may be from your own. And we're not here to convince you of the value of any particular practice, but rather just to offer food for thought. And I'm uh, very happy to uh, introduce our guest today, um, Dawn Boyer, who I had a seven year experience of being led in gospel singing and other forms of roots music. Um, Dawn is a wonderful singer She's a wonderful musical conductor of a group of people, a choir. She's also a great artist and writer. So she has three major ways to uh, lift the spirit. And uh, we're going to start by asking Dawn to share about her spiritual journey over life. Thanks, Joel and Ted. Great to be here with both of you. Whew, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, my spiritual journey, I'm sure like many, has taken lots of twists and turns throughout life. I was raised in an Irish Catholic family, um, so church was a very important part of our lives until I was 11 and my mother uh, and father were divorced. And so church was no longer uh, after that um, because my mother was not excommunicated, but back then in the 70s, mm. it was a big no-no. <clears throat> you couldn't be part of the church if you were divorced. So I experienced both sides of the religion. First, my mother was very devout and then very angry afterwards. So there was kind of this dual um, edged kind of battle going on um, in her that we as kids picked up. Um, I did go to a Catholic high school for one year and questioned too much. Um, <laughs> I was always a kid who thought a lot and wanted to dig deeper into the meaning um, of things in life. And so at 14 years old, was questioning why women couldn't be priests, why women had to wear things on their head when men didn't, um, was told because uh, Paul talked about women's hair being the source of their vanity, and uh, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. So, And of course, the abortion question back then, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade had um, come into law at that point, and so it was on a lot of people's minds, and the nuns were not happy <laughs> with me. Um, so I did seek um, meaning in other ways. For me back then, spirituality was about connection. Um, not necessarily religion and feeling part of something bigger and I was very moved by the stories in the New Testament about um, Jesus Christ and the principles he taught but I couldn't reconcile them with the dogma of the church um, so I turned to things like art and singing even back then and writing uh, to try to make sense of the world and my place in it. And through that, found a really deep sense of connection and also extreme joy. Um, you know, 
to the point where it reverberated inside me, if that makes any, diff um, any sense whatsoever. Sure. Um, and uh, as time did go on, I did seek belonging to a sense or to a community and found a Unitarian church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And it was like, whoa, the angels <laughs> sang, I belonged. It was, it finally made sense. You know, there was um, an intellectual component to it um, and very, you know, a large community of people who are very into social justice and walked the walk. And so, um, and women could be ministers as well. Everybody was equal. <laughs> So it was, it was great, and uh, belonged to that for a, a very long time. Um, eventually, kind of moved away. I'm not quite sure what happened or why, but um, did move away from it and didn't go uh, to any church for a very long time. And uh, started a nonprofit organization called Project Music Works um, because I wanted to find a way to um, have music. Um, touch others the way it had touched me and I had sung all kinds of music I had you know bands in high school the, the typical rock bands I wanted to be Chrissy Hind of the Pretenders <laughs> and the Leather Pants and all that stuff and and then um, had also sung blues and folk um, and um, I was asked to solo for a gospel choir a local gospel choir and in singing the music, saw people be brought together in a way I hadn't seen with any of the other music. So the wheels started turning in my head, and I kept thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could bring this music to people, not just at gospel brunches, but you know, who are in hospice or hospitals or nursing homes, even jail, um, and sing songs with them provide high quality musicianship and you know just kind of see what happens with that and also have a choir so the community could have a chance to to sing it and experience it for themselves and that's how project music works uh, was started with myself and five other, five other women who wanted to jump on board literally on the board <laughs> and uh, that was 20 years ago it's hard to believe it's been that long and um, that's how the choir Rock My Soul started and how the, the other mission of going out and teaching people about the music and singing songs to people who are in need came about. Um, I now also sing in a UCC church, uh, my very good friend and also accompanist for the choir, brilliant musician Mike Effenberger uh, is the music director there and asked if I could come in and help out with the choir there. So I've been doing that as well and kind of started loving that church because again the people are really wonderful and kind walk the walk and there's that sense of community um just want to loop back to the whole catholicism part too i remember going to ccd which is what for those who aren't catholic what you do when you're an adolescent and you're going to be confirmed in the church and we were taught about community and it was kind of like this abstract concept i didn't really get the connection wasn't there for me and um because i didn't see it mm -hmm. so much um now i, I want to also uh, preface it with there are many wonderful things about the catholic religion it's just my experience uh, with it i couldn't i didn't see um the practice go with the theory so um mm -hmm. my journey led me to um more of a uh I guess you could say liberal um, community of people and you know who accept everybody um, it's a life-affirming church everybody's welcome no matter what their identity is and uh, it's put into practice and that's where I feel the love that's talked about in the Bible and every other great religion and so that's what it's about for me long-winded answer I know no, that's, but a great answer. <laughs> that's a complicated question yeah. <laughs> I've heard you sing a number oh. of times with, with Rock My Soul. Oh, nice. And um, one of the things that uh, struck me as I thought about this interview is that the, uh, the, the title of this show is Lifting Your Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that Rock My Soul 
is just so uplifting to hear. Thank you. That means and, a lot. And so I, I wanted to sort of delve into that a little bit, mm -hmm. kind of the vision that you had when it started, you know, the people that you recruited and musicians, how it how it all came together to yeah. create this uh, wonderful sense of uh, connection and spirit um, mm -hmm. when you know being in the audience going going to see oh thank you well I'm, first I'm so glad that that you've had that experience because um, that's definitely what we want and and that's a great question about how it all started um, oh where do I even begin um, it did start with the five other women who had taken part in this other gospel choir uh, and like any journey, <laughs> it had its its obstacles to overcome, its ups and downs. Um, we put press releases out. Basically, we had a vision for what we wanted the choir to be, which was welcoming anybody from every uh, religious um, faith background or none at all, uh, because we kind of looked at it as this great experiment. You know, we we were fascinated. Well, I was fascinated. Um, by the whole history uh, behind gospel music. When I saw people come together, I thought, I've got to dig deeper and find out what's going on, why? Why does this music reach people in such a deep way? And the more I read um, about the songs coming from, you know, slave spirituals and what they meant, the, the, the coding behind the words and the struggle that we can't even imagine today that enslaved people had to go through how did they keep going? And they did it through song and communicated with one another um, as a way to sustain mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. and escape to freedom. Um, for instance, a lot of people don't know that Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, you know, a song we all know and love and sing, was about Harriet Tubman. She was known as Old Chariot, and the chariot was um, the, the uh, Underground mm. Railroad to Freedom. And uh, during her, she held her own funeral service, which I love. You know, this little five foot tall <laughs> woman who was just petite, but as strong as, as could be. Um, she was ill, she knew the end was coming, and on her deathbed had her minister and two friends there, and she chose that song to sing um, for her own going away. <laughs> uh, so when you read things like that and you you see that um, that these people used that music as a source of strength and then how it came through hundreds of years later, for instance, during the civil rights movement, the same songs with different words. Um, you know, one comes to mind, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus became woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom and people sang it while they were in jail or being beaten um, and it was their glue it held them together so when you learn how deep that goes and how mm. strong a source of inspiration and uplifting it is how can anybody not relate to that you know we all go through trials of our own and we all want to give up and in this world <laughs> It's tough these days, you know, people are going through a tough time. So if there's a way to find song to get us through, that's an easy thing to do because we all have music in us. We all want to sing. Um, and so our DNA is hardwired to respond to it. And um, yeah, so we share those stories during shows as well to help people deepen the meaning for themselves and make sense of it in their own ways. So anyway, um, we started out kind of not knowing quite who we wanted to be. <laughs> um, would this work? Would it not work? And to our delight, uh, people were responding to it. Uh, on the other side of that, there have been some people who have a hard time with it, too. Um, we, we've kind of found ourselves in this really in-between space of we're not a religious group, um, but yet we do have, you know, all of us do have our own spirituality. How do we dance around this really loaded question of religion um, with our audiences and our choir members? Because we would have some choir members come in and be very upset that we weren't espousing any faith tradition, you know, that it was bigger than any of us. Um, and they wanted... Uh, very narrowly defined um, 
uh, set of rules about that. And other people were like, I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. I don't want, I don't even want to sing the word Jesus. So <laughs> that's what I mean by that delicate dance. And so I've had to many times talk about how it, if we can just dig down into what we all have in common, what Jesus taught was about being a good human being, you know, being the best that we can be and always strive toward that. Um, and I could go off into a completely different tangent about the the Gnostic go Gospels. I don't even know if I'm saying the word right, but about how a lot of them were put away because they talked about church being within people instead yes. of yes. outside of people. Yes. Um, I think it's always important to talk about those. Yes, yes, I do too, because they rich were source. very rich source. And, you know, they were put away for political reasons. You know, the people in power, um, <laughs> if you have church in yourself, we can't control you. So we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna let that go. Um, so yeah, but it is really important. Um, and so that's kind of where we come from. We all have our different church inside of ourselves. And through time, you know, like with anything, you discover really what you're about and you attract people who respond to that. And so here we are now um, with the group of people who come from all different traditions and they get it, you know, and they're there to sing and and all come together through that source of strength that, that the spirituals, you know, had. Mm -hmm. um, and we tie other traditions of music into it too, because every form of popular American music comes from those slave spirituals. So blues come from it. Many blues musicians, for instance, played in church too and brought their own um, style in, Thomas Dorsey being the main one. Um, and jazz ties into it. Uh, what we call Americana, which is, you know, the roots music, um, old style country, uh, folk blended in there too, you know, the Appalachian um, traditions from Scotland and Wales um, were also tied into the, the uh, African American spirituals. They all kind of cross pollinated. And so um, then we move into rock and roll, which was actually started by a woman. Did you know that? Yeah, I was just going to uh, say, I just watched um, Little Richard, King and Queen of Rock and Roll. Oh, great, yeah. Um, yeah. PBS a documentary, and it's all about him being one of the originators. Yeah. But I know from you, yeah. <laughs> Sister Rosetta Tharp That's was right. before. Her. That's right, and Little Richard learned his chops <laughs> right. from her. Yeah. yeah, Sister Rosetta Tharp was amazing. Yeah, yes. She played a guitar like nobody had before. Mm. Chuck Berry copied her. Elvis copied her, you know, with his singing. Uh, Little Richard, like you said, Jerry Lee Lewis, they all, they all got their style from her. So um, we need to make that more visible. You know, she was amazing in her heyday. 20,000 people came to her third wedding, <laughs> held in a stadium in Washington, D.C., and she charged admission. <laughs> so, and then sadly, you know, years went on and she died penniless and um, alone. Um, and her grave was unmarked for many, many years. It wasn't until 2008 that some people said, this is not right, and raised funds to give her a proper grave site with a, a headstone and are doing their best to uh, make her history known and make her visible mm. again. So, so we can set the record straight. But yeah. this is how rich this music is, you know? It's tied to everything that we do without our even knowing it. Mm. And it's such a, a wonderful, rich cultural resource that we've been given, a gift we've been given, and we need to celebrate it. Mm -hmm. So, does I that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to what you, you're talking about, your experience with the Catholic Church and what mm -hmm. struck me when you talked about that and said the Catholic Church has many wonderful things. Mm, it absolutely. just wasn't working for me. And right. I think that's really a key point. Yeah. It's not that the re any religion is right or wrong or good or bad. Exactly. It's there to try to lift your spirit. Right. And you just uh, find the match for you. Right. right. And it's not always even religion that's the match you have shared already. Yeah. Art and yep. writing and music, mm -hmm. and you, you had in your biography, art, writing, and music was kind of my trinity. My personal trinity. trinity, that's exactly what I call it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. those are the three things that kept me 
true north, you know, where I need to be. And I have, you know, all through my life, one would take over more than the other. It's kind of been a, another <laughs> dancing, balancing act, trying to incorporate all of them. Um, and one will be the main source where the other two are kind of supporting <laughs> what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, for instance, um, I started out thinking I was going to be a writer. I had my MFA in writing. I was going to be a novelist by the time I was 40 and still working on that novel. It was a lot bigger than I realized when I started it. Um, and eventually music took over, you know, with the choir and that was my main focus for a long time. And now art has come in and said, it's my turn. And interestingly, music and writing both play a very important role in my artwork itself. Um, and I just submitted a piece, for instance, about um, women's voices being made invisible in the arts. And so I'm using the music of female jazz composers. Um, can you name one? Carrie Lynn Herring. Um, Carrie Lynn... What? The jazz, the drummer. Oh, see, you've got one I don't know. Yeah. Oh, is she a composer or? And yeah, she's she is. Oh, yeah. well, I will look her up because yeah. I'm always seeking them. Yeah. But I'm really impressed that you could name one because yeah. most people kind of have the deer in the headlights look like. No. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not alone. Um, they are probably the most invisible of all. They can name people can name jazz singers, female jazz yeah. singers. You know, who doesn't know Ella Fitzgerald, right? Mm -hmm. But composers. But you can name male jazz composers. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. A lot of people can. Um, so my mission is to paint to their music. I play a song over and over and over again, uh -huh. so I can really dig mm -hmm. down into what it's trying to say, you know, all the different layers of what's going on, and paint to that, and every painting is titled, um, has the same title as the composition, and I envision a show at some point with, you know, an exhibit of all of the works with the music playing, so people can look at the paintings and listen to the music and read the bio of the composer so we can make them visible again. Mm, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and another series I, I use the works of women poets and every painting has the poem written in my handwriting underneath but then there are layers covering up the, you know, the words, the voice, they peek through a little bit um, and again, you know, have the, the bio of the, the poet with the poem by the painting so that people can dig into um, what's going on there too. The, the, all creative forces kind of all enhance each other and mm. you know that's what we do as human beings we take what other people offer and inspire something in us and we you know give something out to the world because of it so those two series that's the whole point is to mm. say hey women have been doing this all along and they've been doing it beautifully and mm. we need to need to really pay attention to them too so. Well, this woman has done some beautiful artwork <laughs> with Thank some you. spiritual titles. One yeah. being Close and Holy, mm -hmm. and the other being A Little Moment of Belief. Right, so right. Could you say anything about those Yes, two? absolutely. Um, Close and Holy is uh, was painted um, while I was listening to Dil Dylan Thomas read his very famous poem, A Child's Christmas in Wales. Mm -hmm. It's a tradition in my house. Um, my husband and I listen to it every Christmas morning. Um, but if you read it, it, the language is just so beautiful. And as a writer, that's what I respond to. But there's this one moment toward the end when the little boy is in bed and he's looking out into the close and holy darkness. And what that, I'm, I'm getting chills just talking, just, that's how deep it goes for me, because all my life as a kid, that's what, I've written about it in short stories, you know, um, I still do it. Look out at night and you just feel the blanket of night around, and I feel so connected at that point, looking up at the stars or out at whatever landscape is there with the moon shining. and. I'm, I'm part of something bigger, you know, mm -hmm. and and I feel connected to it. And so that's what that painting is about. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is um, inspired by a poem by a Scottish poet, female Scottish poet, Jackie Kay. And 
it was a part of a series of a road trip that I took in Scotland with my Scottish friend Lorna and uh, it was after the death of my um, husband Brett who was a wonderful musician and he was involved in Rock My Soul as well I could not have done it without him we had many arguments in the beginning but uh, many creative differences and kind of very strong-willed people but uh, managed to come together and and create something good he was uh, a fabulous musician, a wonderful human being, and definitely made me a better person. Tragically, he um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor and fought it for seven years, but um, passed away six years ago now. And his loss has been really uh, a huge, a huge thing for many people, you know, um, his family, all who knew him. He was just one of those special mm -hmm. souls, I think Joel can mm -hmm. vouch. Absolutely. Um, so she took me on the road trip as a way to heal. Nature has always been spiritually my go in, my go to, and we brought some of his ashes with us. And um, on our first date, Brett and I had a conversation at dinner, and he said, "What's your favorite movie?" And I said, oh, "Tough one, but I'm gonna have to say right now, Local Hero." Mm. And he said, "You're kidding, because mm. that's my favorite movie too." So I looked at him, I said. I'll make a great Gordon Gordon, or I'll make a good Gordon Gordon. And he's like, you know the words, you know the dialogue, you know, and stuff. So it was like, right then we knew, all right, something's going on here. And um, so what we did in Scotland, part of the trip was we went to the two places that Local Hero was filmed on wow. the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, the West Coast is the village. You know, if you watch the movie, you see that lovely village, you know, with, uh, right by the sea, and there's a cliff right behind it. It's quite a drive to get down to it. We're holding our breaths, both down and back. Um, and then the second part on the East Coast, oh, sorry, I just backed it. I mean, the East Coast is the village. The West Coast is the beach scenes. Um, and so we went to the beach with the mountains, and you'll see that in the painting. That's what that's all about. Um, and sprinkled some of his ashes and kind of quoted from the movie, the two of us. And, and right as we were doing it, light broke through the clouds and just shone in this beautiful way. And it was gorgeous. And we both thought, okay, this is the right send off, you know. And mm. so he mm. would have just been tickled pink to know that, uh, that part of him is there now. And um, so that's what inspired that painting. Um, yeah, so all, all of my work has a very deep spiritual connection. And for me, nature is a big part of it, in addition to the, the art and the music mm. and the writing. I think the romantic in me would say that, that he actually was tickled pink and was actually present in that oh, moment. I believe it. Light I believe it. Through. Yep, yep. Mm. I have no doubt about that. Yeah. I know some people would laugh at it, but no, there's, yeah. there's no coincidence. Yeah. I don't think. And uh, interestingly, just to talk about those two paintings, somebody out there was responding because a collector approached me. Those paintings were on Sachi Art, the Sachi Art site. And a woman from San Diego, or a neighborhood outside of San Diego, bought both of them, saying how much that they moved her. And when I told her mm. about the story behind the Child's Christmas in Wales, she came from that part really? of the country and <laughs> said how much she was missing the winter scenes of her country and uh, was just thrilled that, you know, that it actually was what she was responding to. And the same with the other one, too. You know, it just really made her feel connected in a bigger way. So, you know, those ripples go out. People pick up. They don't really know all the time, but they're picking up what's, what's going on. It's a really cool story. Just mm -hmm. and I've become very fond of her. You know, we write back and forth um, with poetry and um, different things that are inspiring us. So I had no idea who she was before I before she bought the paintings, and now here we have this long distance, you know, correspondence going on. It's great. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving space for you. I'm <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm speechless. Uh, that, that that's an extraordinary story, and that it's you know uh, uh, began I think a little bit before that. I, I had I had it in my mind. I wanted to uh, ask about you know the synergy between um, 
the artwork and the music and mm -hmm. the writing, but you just explained that mm -hmm. so well. Uh, and that um, the description of the of the scene, uh, you know, of, 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 uh, on on the beach mm -hmm. with the light coming through, that that's um, all of that taking together is is just kind of very sort of inspiring for me in Thank in you. terms of uh, uh, kind of the revelation of the connectedness the oneness of everything mm. and mm -hmm. uh, it's you know really great to great to hear that thank you yeah it's it's great to share it um, I'm thinking about what you said in the beginning about how a big part of spirituality is what we give to others you know um, yes. and uh, that's truly what it is I've always said and always believed that um, if we've been given a gift, it's really our duty to share it. Because if we hold it, the world becomes very small, and we become small. And um, you know, in this society, you know, for I think for women especially, not all, you know, not, not exclusively, but we often think, "Who am I to to think I'm any good at whatever?" You know, we support other people, and um, no, we each have. That's something that is really important to share. And in fact, Joel has experienced being at concerts, and we end almost every show by saying that very thing. We each have that light inside mm. of us. And then the, what you were talking about being one, it's ours, it's unique, but we also all share it. Yes. All share it. Yes. So if Beautiful somebody, book. yeah, if somebody hides it, you take it away from someone else. And so we have to share it or else the world really gets dark. Mm. And I think we've seen that with some leaders who <laughs> don't share it at all. <laughs> they share something else. But uh, yeah, so we need, to, we need to be sharing that light big time. And that is through our gifts that we're given. You know, whether it's just being kind, it's huge. You know? And so then we go into this little light of mine. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to let it shine. That's right. that's right. And that's what we end with. Yeah, absolutely. Right. A great rock and rendition of this little right. light of mine. Yeah. You, um, in your bio again, used another strong spiritual term saying that when you were first singing in a school choir, mm -hmm. it was an awakening for you. Yes. Yes. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, well, the first, the first little awakening I had was a few years before that, when I was five. And my dad was, uh, he loved playing guitar and singing. He came from North Carolina and that whole tradition. They didn't know how to talk about feelings necessarily, but boy, they sang about them. Or they told stories about them. Um, so that's where the writing and the music comes from for me. And he was playing Patsy Cline. And the memory is crystal clear. I was on this um, chair, and you know, being a kid, I was backwards in it. Had my head against the back cushions, and my feet popping out, and my feet just started wiggling <laughs> to it. And like, oh, this, you know, whatever that voice just I was like, oh, something is going on here, and it was great. And so I knew I wanted to sing right then and there. Um, but being five, you know. <laughs> limited kind of singing um, then got into school and got into chorus and um, the songs just moved me so much I just was transported and there was one moment um, where I had been practicing you know we were doing all of our practicing and we sang um, the three dog night song black and white I don't know if you remember that from the 70s and I just loved the message of it back then. And I think I was 12, maybe 11 or 12 at that point, still very young. And I missed one of the practices where they changed part of what they were gonna do. Um, so we're singing and I'm so in the moment of it. I go right into what we had practiced, which was holding this note and I was singing it with all of my heart and being. And everybody looked at me like, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> it's like, I'm in the song. What are you guys doing? <laughs> so it was like an inadvertent mistake, but I didn't care. It was just, I was in it. <laughs> um, so yeah, but that being with other people and singing, you just, um, it does something to us 
spiritually and it also does something to us physically. I don't know if you've read the studies where... You've talked about Yeah, it. yeah, where um, I know Dana Farber now uh, treats stroke um, patients and other people whose brains have been affected, they treat them with music um, and insurance will now pay for it because it's so good for the brain mm. um, to get them back where they need to be. Um, and we all know the stories about certain people uh, who have aphasia, who can't talk but can sing. Mm. Um, but there's also the physics part of it um, where the vibrations when you're singing together actually everybody's heartbeat will start going to the same rhythm and mm. yeah we all just start experiencing the same bodily sensations together people live longer and are healthier when they sing in groups with other people too so it's really good for our health as well as our spiritual well-being so it's pretty fascinating stuff you know when you think about that it is yeah and harmony the vibrations of harmony and Joel, you remember uh, every, and we still do at every rehearsal, um, after we warm up, we all just kind of sing one note together until we all get into tune. And it's like a chant. Um, and you know when you're all in tune together because you feel that vibration. It's like if you have your tip of your finger um, on a wet glass, you know, where mm. it starts doing that mm. whoa, whoa, whoa. When everybody's in tune and that starts happening, <gasps> You can feel it. It's really great. It's a great sensation. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, you're talking quite a bit throughout the whole sharing about how people can lift their spirit. Mm -hmm. So anything more that you'd like to add about? Yeah, um, I would say, um, and I can't say enough, you know, Really dig into yourself. What are you passionate about? What gives you joy? And do it. You know, just do it. It doesn't matter how small um, you think it is or how it won't make any difference. It does make a difference. It will be huge, you know. Um, and, yeah, go for it. And, and also, you know, I hear people say, follow your bliss. Yes, Joseph Campbell was wonderful. But he also talked about that whole hero's journey. You, the only way to truly follow your bliss is to make it through those obstacles and they're gonna be there you know too often we think I'm gonna have my passion and everything's gonna be wonderful no that's not the point the point is to follow it and go through those obstacles and learn and be a better person because of it you know my journey with rock my soul with my art with my writing there have been immense struggles where I've come to that come to Jesus moment where like <gasps> can I really do this? Am I really good enough? You know, should I give it up? And every time, it's like, just keep on going. And then I get better. You know, so that's what makes life meaningful. You know, making it through the tough stuff, because none of us is going to escape it. Mm -hmm. So hold on to that, that thing that, that you love and express it, no matter what, I guess would be what I'd say. And, and you talked about a very difficult time in your life when you read that. Yeah, died. yeah. So talk about difficulties and obstacles of mm. making it through. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed that you would come to practice and you would, it, it was obvious your spirit was just lifting. Mm -hmm. As we warmed up yes. and as yes. we started singing, yeah. so anything yeah. you want to say about making it through those most difficult of times? I w I would love to. Yeah, um, I remember one time coming. Matt, uh, Brett was in Mass General, and it was, you know, I knew we were probably a couple of years away, and things were starting to happen. No, oh, sorry, it was later than that, that we didn't have a whole lot longer left. And I was at Mass General, and I came back that Tuesday night, and Mike Effenberger, the accompanist, kind of quietly said, what are you doing here? And I said, I need this as much as you guys do. This is my glue. And I did, I, that's what I needed. Um, I could have turned toward drinking or, you know, just checking out, but no, I needed song. I needed community. I needed to be with people and sing and, you guys held me together more than you realize. I knew I had to hold it together in front of you as your director, and luckily I'm very good at, you know, going into, okay, it's time to be director and put away the other stuff and everything, but, um, yeah, it was, that was, that kept me going. It really did. I don't exaggerate. Beautiful example of what you were talking about before, yeah. about the healing quality of yeah. music, yeah. particularly 
with good other point. people. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have definitely experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to speak to, before we finish up, your preaching. When we would go to the Portland <laughs> UU Church, and you would yeah. lead the service, and you would do the sermon. Yeah, so yeah. anything you want to say about it? Um, I will sharing the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that there have been many times people have said to me, "You've missed your calling. <laughs> you should be a preacher." Um, or a therapist. Those are the two things that people often will say to me, and it's like, well, um, thank you very much. Um, but if you really dig into that preaching part, it's just me being a writer, being spiritually connected, and talking what I passionately believe, you know, and trying to bring people together you know, through some kind of common thing we can all relate to. Um, and I love performing, and that's part of being a preacher, right? You're up there drawing people into a story. and um, yeah, so <laughs> I love preaching, yeah. but I'll never be a minister because I don't ever want to handle all the other stuff that comes with it. <laughs> yeah, I've been in churches that have kind of broken apart and lots of stuff going on, and, and I admire the people who handle all of that. But I can handle my 25, 30 member choir when that goes on, but I can't even imagine a church of hundreds of people with different interests pulling apart at each other and stuff. So, yeah, just give me the, the sermon and I'm happy. <laughs> Well, that was a, a beautiful description of what it is to share uplifting message. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. That was, that was really Thanks. Comes from the heart. Yeah. 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 Well, I really appreciate you know you asking me to be here today. It's it's wonderful to talk about this. I mean, people don't yeah. often talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Right. Great. Absolutely, and, and thank you for coming. This has been really great. I've thank really you. Enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. pleasure's mine. Thank you very much. And, and that's why we're doing the show. What you were saying that yeah. doesn't often get talked about right. in this way. Right. So yeah. we're hoping that people, when they tune in, will be lifted. Yeah. And yeah. have some encouragement, as you talked about, make it through mm -hmm. the obstacles and share about spirit. Right. Oh, and that, that was something else I was going to say when you asked that last question. Find the people who make you feel uplifted. Right. And make sure you hang on to them and keep them around you because it's so important. We can't do it alone. Yeah, that's yeah. what this guy's about. Nice. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to one of your meditation things. That sounds interesting, so I'll have to talk to you about that more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So, um... Maybe you will be able to catch this show on Wednesday uh, at 11.30, the third Wednesday of each month. If not, you can go to Newburyport Media Hub website, and in the upper right-hand corner are the um, icons for YouTube and SoundCloud, and you'll find all the shows that we've done there. And uh, thank Ooh. you for listening in, and thank you so much for being here today, Doug. Thank you.